It is 1954. But that doesn't matter right now. Have you seen it? I, I don't know what it is, but wee Tommy says he's seen it. And he's always knocking about the graveyard, so... So he'd know. Giant teeth, he says. Huge iron ones that are all rusted in its maw. Apparently it grins at you before it chases you, so you know fine well how it's going to feel when they big sharp teeth munch down on you. Oh aye, good luck out running it. It's seven foot tall. You couldn't even hide behind the heat stains because it would see right over them all. Aye, well he says it's a vampire, but I don't know about that. I've never seen one. All I know for sure is that it's eaten two boys so far and it's got to be hungry for more. What, what boys? Eh, uh, well, I don't know their names. Uh, I think they went to a different school. Aye, well, it's not like the police are going to do anything about it, so we're all going to go down after school and batter it so that it can't hurt anybody else. And that's where Police Constable Alex Deeprose found them. Hundreds of school children in a cemetery in South Glasgow, armed with knives, sharpened sticks, big dods of wood, and basically any other kind of makeshift weapon you could think of. They told him that they were hunting a vampire, a seven foot tall monstrosity that stalked Glasgow's southern necropolis. Deep Rose would have laughed had it not been for the sheer range of armament that these kids were holding. He confiscated them and sent them home. It led to a moral outrage People clutched their pearls, blamed the new comics that those wains were reading, and presumably shouted things like, Please, please, won't anyone think of the children? The incident of the Gorbals vampire led to the introduction of the Children and Young Persons Harmful Publication Act of 1955. It banned the sale of comics and magazines, portraying incidents of a repulsive or horrible nature to children. Just one thing though, there wasn't a giant character with horrifying iron teeth in any of the comics or the magazines that these kids were reading. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. That's from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 7, in the Bible. So the kids who went out to kill it didn't get their target, because it didn't exist. The Bible can be terrifying, and so can the moral outrage of the general public. But there are monsters out there. Monsters who walk among us. This is Scotland, a podcast about history and where we made it. I'm Michael Park. It is September 1818. On a dark, dark hill, there is a dark, dark city. In the dark, dark city, there is a dark, dark street. In the dark, dark street, there was a dark, dark university building. And in that dark, dark university building, there was a surprisingly well-lit table. And on that surprisingly well-lit table lay a surprisingly well-lit corpse with a blackening ligature mark around its neck. The body, the empty vessel, this husk is that of Matthew Clydesdale, who had been hanged by the neck until dead. He had killed an old man, battered him to death in a fit of rage while he was drunk. They hanged him in front of the high court, as people packed the square to watch his neck snap as the rope went taut. The atmosphere in the auditorium, they call it a lecture theatre, but let's face it, this is for thrills, is electric. 
but that's more to do with the huge electricity generating machines that surround the cadaver on the table. You don't need me to describe the scene, because you've read it in books, heard it in stories, and seen it in a million movies. They call it galvanisation. You might have heard it described differently. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out. When, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull, yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe, or how delineate from the wretch whom, with such infinite pains and care, I had endeavoured to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful. Great God, his yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost the same colour as the dun white sockets in which they were set. His shriveled complexion and straight black lips. It has been eight months since Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, a revolutionary novel by Mary Shelley, was published. And to be honest, why would you not want to give it a go? Medical science is still very much in the experimental stage, and they cut slits into the body as the assembled medical practitioners and rubberneckers in the stands look down, pretending to be shocked. Some of them even pretend to be disgusted. They attach electrodes into different parts of the body and discharge voltage into them. The corpse kicks out and shudders, but it doesn't come back to life. They stimulate the nerves in the diaphragm. The corpse breathes, but it doesn't come back to life. And then they attach the electrodes to his heel and the supraorbital nerve sending electricity coursing through the body, and then suddenly, as one of the doctors later wrote, The most horrible grimaces were exhibited. Rage, horror, despair, anguish and ghastly smiles united their hideous expression in the murderer's face, surpassing far the wildest representations of a Fuseli or a Keen. At this period, several spectators were forced to leave the apartment from terror or sickness, and one gentleman fainted. The account of a Victorian writer and Wheel Kent Glasgow character who claimed to be there has the corpse then sit bolt upright on the table before the doctor in charge grabbed a scalpel and cut his throat, saving the city from a rampaging monstrosity. In actual fact, it was just gross watching a corpse contort and struggle under thousands of volts. Matthew Clydesdale was dead, never to return. After all, you can't use electricity to bring someone back from the dead. Or can you? Nah, just kidding. Happy Halloween. You've been listening to Scotland. It was written and produced by me, Michael Park, and is a production of Be Quiet Media. The music for every episode of Scotland is by our very own Lazarus, Mitch Bain. You can check out more of his work at mitchbain.bequiet.media. Jamie Mowat does amazing illustrations for us, which you can see in our episode art. See more and buy prints at tidlin.com. Scotland is supported by Chris Lingwood, Tony B., Mike McQuaid and listeners like you on Patreon. You can get loads more from us for as little as £3 a month 
at patreon.com forward slash bequietmedia. You can find out more about the show and read transcripts on our website, scotlandpodcast.net. And we're on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram too. Find us by searching Scotland, a Scottish history podcast. Thanks for listening. Look after each other. Wear a mask. Get vaccinated if you can. We'll see you next time.